pianist needs some of this power. There we go. Can you raise your voice in the back and open us in prayer this morning or this evening? You may be seated. Song number 18 in your hymn books. Song number 18 in your hymn books. Take the name of Jesus with you.
129 in your hymn books tonight, Rock of Ages, if I remember correctly. Yes, we are doing a duet together, just so everyone knows. Is this the first one? Save me. No, this one, we have done this, um, a duet together before during Sinks So, right. mm. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Living he loves me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming, one day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Amen. 
Good job, Mariah. And Pete. I haven't figured out what part he was singing yet. He does, he does what I do. I usually sing in the key of off, so he was right there with me. You did good, Peter. I'm sorry if I wasn't giving you enough of a compliment. Hebrews chapter 5, turn there, and we're going to take some testimonies. I like testimonies. I don't know if you do or not, but I love testimonies. I like to hear what God's doing for our people. I like to know what's going on. And it's always good to give God a thank you or a praise or whatever it is in your testimony that you have to give him. So who's going to be first? Ruth. Wow. Is that Daniel? Daniel? Yeah. Good. He probably wanted to get up enough nerve to tell you about that new girlfriend he's wanting to marry. Oh. Well, amen. Danny's a good boy. He just got back off a missions trip to Peru, if I'm not mistaken. Ecuador. I knew it was down there somewhere. Uh, here comes Miss uh, Phyllis. I keep getting these remarks about her hair on Facebook. Somebody told me that today how cute your hair is on Facebook. No, tell them. Turn around and face the camera and tell them, thank you. I don't think they could see you there, but anybody else? Testimonies? Kathleen? Amen. I'm glad you landed right at this church, too. You've been a blessing ever since the first days. I should brag on her, but it would embarrass her. Barbara, should I do it anyway? You know this girl, every time there's a missionary here, gives far above probably what the average person in this church gives to a missionary on a fixed income, and she earns her money at handicrafters. And I am so proud of her. Uh, she has been a personal supporter of Atlantic Coast Baptist College for as long as I've known her above and beyond what she does with her tithing. And I am so proud of her. And not only that, she takes me out for lunch once in a while or dinner after church. She is a really good girl, and I really love her. Uh, Barbara. Well, you want to think about it? Mariah had her hand up. I'll come back to you. Mariah. Wow. Hey, I had a sleeper bed at the house you could have had. It's almost not brand new, but... Well, good. Well, amen. Amen. Barbara, did you think of it? Well, it's like, it's like Tom Malone said, when you get those thoughts, it's like coveys of quail flying through your brain, and you've got to reach out and grab them right then because they're gone. Uh, what's your name again? Janice. Amen. 
Amen. Some of you don't know Janice's background as foster parent. How many had you had? She had 98, and you think that's good? Jeannie had 300 and something foster kids that went through her house through the years. So both these girls have done a fantastic job. I, I tell folks I could never be a foster parent because once I got them and got attached to them, I'd be pulling guns on people when they came back to get them. Would not want to let them go. I'm sorry, Barbara. Get to you before you forget it. Amen. Well, tell her we're on the, on the internet, on Facebook. If you share my video on your Facebook, it'll go to all the people you're contacted with on Facebook. And then tell her to come visit us and maybe she'll want to move out here. Uh, the question I would have for her is who would want to live in California? Mm. Well, I wouldn't want her to move and leave her husband. <laughs> Get here, don't take me wrong. Okay, anybody else before we start? I thought Shirley would have one. I couldn't believe she'd have her hand up. Shirley. Amen. He did. Amen. Anybody else? Okay, Hebrews chapter 5, going to begin reading in verse 11. It says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of, of meat, milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth unto them that are of full age, even though those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Title of the message tonight, not that it's all that important, how to get off the bottle. How to get off the bottle. Now, as soon as I said that, Louise is thinking, I'm, I'm going to tell people how to quit drinking alcohol. Or maybe somebody's trying, going to say to themselves, I'm going to tell them how to quit drinking beer and get off the beer bottle, or the wine bottle, or any other bottle that you might be addicted to. And in reality, it is a bottle people are addicted to, and church members are addicted to this bottle. And it's the baby bottle. I want to share with you some thoughts tonight. I hope will challenge you. I understand as I preach this message to you that you are the good folks of the church that are here all the time. I talked to a preacher this week. Some of you remember him. His name was Pat Creed Jr. Uh, he was here for two of our jubilees. And he called me to see when we were having a jubilee last Friday night. And I said, well, we already had it. We ha had it just for four days, Sunday through Wednesday. And he says, isn't that a shame that you have to shorten meetings like that because you can't get people to come? And then he says to me, we did something different in our church. We're doing Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday meetings because Friday night, there's nobody has to get up to go to work the next day, and there's no kids that have to get up and go to school the next day. And Saturday night, the same reason, and Sunday, they should be in church anyway. And I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, yeah, that's true, but isn't it a shame that we have to baby our people along 
trying to get them to take what's best for them. This passage of scripture, the writer here, who I believe was the Apostle Paul, says that too many people are dull of hearing and they're not ready to take the meat of the word. What, what level of maturity are you in your Christian life? Just think about it for a minute. What level of maturity are you in your Christian life? Just put it on a physical scale. Are you an infant? Or are you a toddler? Are you a juvenile, which would put from the time you walk and start school up to when you go into middle school? Are you a teenager? Are you a young married age? Are you a middle aged? Or are you like most of us in this room tonight? Are you in our golden years? Well, in our golden years, we've all found out nothing gold except that gold in our teeth in our golden years. But what level are you in your spiritual maturity? You got a thought? You want me to tell you something? Probably none of us are as mature as we think we are. And the reason I'm saying that is because maturity comes with time, but it's not just time, it's application of the Word of God. And I will dare to say there's not a person in this room that applies everything you know about the Word of God all the time. So that makes us not very mature. How would it be if your young people came to you when, they were, when you had your kids at home and they said to you, Louise, I'm going to obey you, but only when I want to? How would that have gone across? Or Phyllis, if they came, came to you and they said, Phyllis, or they said, Mommy, Mommy, I'm going to obey you, but only if I have time to do it. How would that have gone across? Or Mama and Ruth, if they'd come to you and say, Mama or, or Mommy, I'm going to obey you, but just when I feel like it. It's not going to, right? And yet, those of us in this room act like that to God. Now look what Paul says, and I'm just going to say Paul, if you don't think he wrote the book and you just count that as my opinion, I can't prove it scripturally, but he says here, when you ought to be teachers, you have need to one teach you again. He's saying when you're mature enough that you should be teaching others the truths that he wanted to give to you, you have to be taught again. Uh, I, I could ask you this question. You hear me say there's nothing new under the sun. Well, there is nothing new under the sun. But I guarantee you some of you have heard me preach things that to you you've never heard them preached or taught before. Not because they're new or not because they're false uh, doctrines, but simply you've never been confronted with them before. Barbara, when she came out of the Jehovah's Witnesses, she had never been confronted with the truth of God's word. So I'm sure that when she started coming here, she started hearing me preach and teach some stuff that was a little different than what she was used to. Bob's been saved how long now, Bob? Four years, five years? Four years. I guarantee you when he heard me preach, there were some things that God enlightened in his heart that he had never learned before. They were new thoughts and new things. But all of us have been taught things. Now I want us to get to the point in our church, in my life, I want to get to the point where I'm wanting the meat of the word and I'm not satisfied with just the milk of the word. I don't want to have to have people teaching me again and again and again before I respond to it. When you hear me and I say it all the time about kicking that dead horse, why should I have to say that when the word of God says, forsake not, the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. Even so much more as you see the day approaching. I, I should only have to read that from God's word one time. And we would be in church if we were going to apply the teaching of the word of God. But we make excuses and we have reasons and everybody's got an elbow and everybody's got a reason why that doesn't always apply to them. So we're going to have a word of prayer and then I hope to be able to show you some things that will help you get off the bottle, and get on the meat of the Word of God. It will help you get to the point where you're not an immature Christian, but a mature Christian. And just before I pray, let me make this one observation. When you plant an apple tree, and it's brand new, do you plant it one week and go out and expect to get apples off of it the next week? What does it have to do? 
But when it matures, what do you expect it to do? Now, follow my logic. Is that reasonable? Well, then is it reasonable that Christians, as we mature, we bear fruit also? And the fruit of a Christian is, and don't tell me love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, against such, there is no law. It's soul sharing the gospel and have people get saved after they hear the gospel. So with those thoughts in mind, remember what level you thought you were? We're probably not quite to the level we think we are. And we probably all need to get off the baby bottle and get off the pablum and get off the baby food and get to the meat of scripture. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us this challenge in your word. And Lord, that's why I like preaching on Sunday night, Wednesday night, because the folks that are here, they want the challenge from God's word. They don't want me to just make them feel good and they don't want just the good sound and stuff. They come because they want to grow, and I thank you for that. And so tonight, help us to see some things that will help us kick the baby bottle, get off the baby bottle, and mature as Christians. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Big number one, if you're going to kick the baby bottle, here's something that you need to try. It will work. Number one, you need to have a definite experience of salvation. I've got verses I'm going to ask people to read with each one of these, like I do on Wednesday night. So it'll be a teaching, preaching type of thing. But you need to be definite in your salvation experience. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.12, Peter, would you read that for me? 2 Timothy 1.12. Now, you've heard me say, Peter mentioned it this morning in Sunday school, that the churches are filled with people who have linked their salvation to something other than a biblical belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've linked it to church membership. They've linked it to, to uh, he said, seven sacraments. Do the Catholics have seven sacraments? Somebody needs to tell me what they are. I don't know what they, not tonight, not right now, but later. But I know that we have communion and baptism, and some people think they're saved because they were baptized. Well, I was baptized twice. The first time I was saved, it was in a, a bayou down in Florida, and I was probably seven years old and didn't have any idea what I was doing, and all I did was got wet. I went down a dry center and came up a wet center. Didn't do anything, there was no testimony. But when I was 12 years old, I got baptized again and I went down, saved and brought back up, raised to walk in newness of life. But these ideas about why you're saved, they need to be biblical ideas. Pete, read that verse for me. I know in whom I have believed it, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that until that day. That's the thought. Are you absolutely 100% certain? It's not because you're a Baptist. No Baptist going to heaven. No Methodist going to heaven. Only blood-bought, saved individuals are going to heaven. It does not have anything to do with the tag that you put on yourself. It has to do with knowing Jesus Christ, the time, the place that it took place. And you need to remind yourself of that often. You need to go back to that time and relive it very often in your mind. Why? Because Satan's going to nail you. You're going to slip up and you're going to say a bad word or you're going to think an evil thought or you're going to do an evil thing. And Satan's going to come to you and he says, See, I told you you weren't saved. And what do we tell Satan? Satan, you're a liar. I was there when it happened. I can tell you the place. I can tell you who was with me. I can tell you what happened. And I can tell you that I meant it in the depths of my heart that I was a sinner and I needed a Savior and Jesus was the only Savior that could take away my sins. Satan, you're a liar. You'll never get off the baby bottle if you have to constantly be bouncing around this concept of getting saved. That's why I tell people, the assurance of salvation is not something that's just kind of neat. It's very important. You won't hit a lick for God on a regular basis if you're constantly worried about whether you're even saved or not. You have to nail that down. You have to remember the time that you gave your heart and your soul to Jesus Christ. And you have to repent of that sin that you've con not confessed since that time and ask him to forgive you again and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And sometimes you have to return to the way you felt and the surrender that you made the day you got saved. 
Habits are easy to make, but they're awful hard to break. And if you get in the habit of laying out of church, and you get in the habit of not reading your Bible, you get in those habits, it's hard to get back in church. And if you've ever been out of church for an extended period of time, you know that's true. And I can tell you that's even true when you don't intend it. If there are things that keep you out of church, maybe you're sick for an extended period of time, or no transportation or other things where you really don't have a choice, it's hard to break that habit and get back in church. But it starts with knowing for certain that you're saved. Mrs. Gilbert, will you read Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10? So the first thing that we need to nail down if we're going to get to the meat of the word is nail down salvation. That's the bottle. That's where you began your life. That's where the Christian life started. And from that point on, you were taking a bottle till you began to mature as a Christian. So you've got to nail that down so you can go on from there. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, read that first verse. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Paul's here saying, he's saying, don't keep trying to get saved again. Drex Little, when he was in the hospital, called me one time, or had Ruth call me and wanted to see me. And I got there, and Drex Little, one of the godliest, sweetest men I've known, um, no, he wasn't perfect, Ruth, and you'll be first to tell me that, but he wasn't perfect, but he was a godly, sweet man. He says to me, Brother Gary, I'm not sure I'm saved. Well, it kind of took me back because I'd known him for 10 or 15 or 20 years at that point. I'm not sure how many, but a long time. And I said, well, tell me how you got saved. And he told me. He told me how he went forward and how he made a decision and how he got saved. And then I asked him a question. I said, well, did you mean it? He said, well, yeah, I meant it. I said, then Drex, what more could you do? You've already done what the Bible said. What more could you do? So you have to get past that point. You have to get past that, that anchor that holds you back wondering if you're really saved or not. And that brings us to the second point. And the second big point is a dedicated life of service. A dedicated life of service. Carolyn, you want to read that verse for me, please? Even the death of the cross. Isn't that what the last part of that verse says? Oh, I was getting that from memory. Duh. So here's the truth. Paul wanted to get to know Christ better, even to the point of suffering. Now what caused Jesus to suffer? No. He had no sin. Well, that's at the cross point of his suffering, but how much suffering did he do before he got to the cross? All the people that mocked him and ridiculed him and the religious leaders who tried to trip him up. Why? Because he was serving God. Even dying on the cross was serving God so that we might have salvation. If you want to be a Christian that's going to be maturing, you have to find what God has for you to do in this matter of service. Now, we've talked about this before, but I'm going to mention it again. Service does not mean coming to church. That's not what you do for God. That's what you do for you so you can grow, so you can serve God. Service is what you do either in the boundaries of this church to help other people grow or outside of this church to reach other people with the gospel. What do we do in service? We have people sometimes that do things that other people don't know about. We had a little angel that just had both of our um, uh, vans lettered. That's service to God. Why? Because when we take our vans out now, people know where those kids are going on that van to go to church. Yeah? And when they go through those... Don't hit her again. When they go through those trailer parks, other people say, hey, there's a, there's a van going to Safe Harbor Baptist Church. I wonder if my kids would like to go there. Even before Pete and Mariah get to knock on the doors. Every place they pass between here and the last place they pick up a child, everybody sees that van coming with kids on it to church. It's a testimony. When we have folks that teach Sunday school, that's serving God. Why? Because you're sharing the truth of the Word of God with people that need to be taught. Now that you're getting a little older, 
you're going to serve God. If you never want to serve God, there's a problem. You know, I was thinking about this idea of, of hyper-Calvinism and predestination. That's an important subject, you know. Uh, people say, well, there's some that are uh, predestined to go to heaven and some predestined to go to hell, and you have no choice. Well, I don't believe in predestination for salvation, but I do believe in predestination. You want me to explain it? Every one of you, every one of us, every Christian is predestined to serve God after you're saved. Well, don't I have a free will in that? No. <gasps> well, I can choose not to serve God if I want to. That's right. You can be a disobedient little brat. Sorry, Louise. You can be a little disobedient stub or what do you, what do you call them? Tarb. Tarb. That's brat without, that's spelled brat backwards, brat. You can be a little disobedient youngin' if you want to. But my Bible says, now listen to this, it's important when it comes to service. Know ye not that you're not with own, your own, but you're bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and your mind, which are, the, which are the Lord's. We are predestined, Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 2, 10, that we might do, that we are, somebody read it for me real quick. My mind's not recalling all these verses. Ephesians 2.10, you know 2.8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But 2.10 says, who's got it? Read it. Don't be bashful. Created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Good works. He didn't say if you want to. He didn't say if you feel like it. That's his determined will. So what are we doing as so-called mature Christians if we're not serving God, if we're not working for God? We, we have for years had this concept, and it's a Catholic-type concept. It's a, a priesthood-type concept. Let the preachers and let the priests, they do all the spiritual work. We're just lay people. I don't find that in the Bible. I'm a pastor, but before I was a pastor, I was called to serve God doing the same things that I do now other than preaching and pastoring, to tell people about Jesus, to serve in Sunday school, to serve on bus routes. And just stop and think back over your early history as a Christian. What did you used to do? Where did you used to serve? Now I'm gonna ask you a question. Who gave you permission to stop? Well, I just got tired of that. We don't have time to get tired of it, folks. I'm 67 years old. I know preachers younger than I am that have already retired. I don't see that in Scripture. Now, I'm not condemning them. They'll have to answer for themselves. But if God gives me voice and strength and, and health to do it, I'm going to preach till I die somehow. If you guys ever smarten up and, and throw me out, which would be the best thing you could ever do, I'm gonna be preaching somewhere. If the police lock me up in jail for something, I'm gonna have the fastest growing church in the cell block. I'm called to preach, but we're all called to serve him. How can we claim to be and list ourselves as mature when we've stopped doing the things that are important? Are there still not lost people around us. When we have our prayer services, there's families that we've been praying for for years now. There's lost co-workers. There are people on your block that don't know Jesus as Savior. Who's going to reach them if we don't? That is our maturity. If we're going to bear fruit and serve God, we have to do that. What happens? when you get a tree that is so old and decrepit it doesn't bear fruit anymore. You cut it down. Well, in my thinking, that's when we stop serving God on this earth. When we get so old and physically decrepit we can't do what we should do and do it effectively, he takes us home. Remember I've told you the story. I had a guy one time tell me because of my background that I should never be a pastor. I should never preach. And I told him, I said, well, Frank, I'll make you a deal. You pray that if God doesn't want me to serve him and preach, he kills me. 
And I'll pray, if God doesn't want me to serve him and preach, he kills me. And if he kills me, we'll be both be happy. Well, God hasn't answered that prayer for me yet. He hasn't answered it for Frank yet. So I guess by that, I'm still supposed to be preaching. My point is, when do we stop? We're blessed with all these things God's given us. When we give testimonies, we talk about it. When do we stop sharing those blessings so that other people can experience it also? Is your salvation experience really as important to you as we talk about it in church? If it is, we ought to be talking about it everywhere. And again, sometimes that's a habit that you have to get into. Having eyes open, soul conscious, constantly looking for ways that you can bring the Savior into the conversation. That you can tell folks about your testimony. Your testimony is one of the most important tools you will ever use in witnessing. Before you know all the verses to answer every question that somebody's going to throw at you, you never will. You have a testimony that nobody can refute because you know what you were and you know what happened and you know what God's done for you. And that's all God asks us to tell people. Then they have to make a determination. So number two, a dedicated life of service. Colossians chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. Let me see. Mariah, let's let you read that one. I'll, I'll stay in family, so to speak. She's my adopted daughter, kind of, sort of. Hope I never have to whoop Pete for it because of her, but. Number three is a determination to follow what the Bible says. An absolute determination to follow what the Bible says. Colossians 1, 10, and 11, Mariah. Do we believe the Bible's the word of God? Well, I saw one head shake and two answers. Let me ask you again. Do we believe the Bible is the word of God? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Does it need to be updated? No. Then why don't we obey it? The reason we don't is because we don't have an absolute determination that we're going to. You know, there, there's a remarkable truth that if you could get young people to believe this, their life would be so much easier. If you just do what mom and dad say, mom and dad are going to do so much more for you that you wouldn't believe it. Isn't that true? If your children, when they were in your home growing up, if they were doing what you wanted them to do and they were not giving you a bunch of hassle, you were doing more for them. When did you stop doing more for them? When they started taking advantage. When they started just expecting it when they wanted to do their own thing and still wanted mom and dad to bless them. No, that's not the way it works. It's not the way it works with God either. We say this Bible is the word of God, and I believe it. I, I will never back down from that. Anything that would cause me to walk out of this church is somebody to tell me that I couldn't preach that this Bible is the very word of God, inspired and preserved by God's power, and we have exactly what God wants us to know. If that's true, when it says it, why don't we do it? We don't determine. We don't make up our mind. The Bible says about Daniel, remember what it says? He purposed in his heart that he was going to obey God and not take the king's meat. He would not defile himself with the king's meat. We're not people of purpose anymore. We're wishy-washy. Well, we will apply the Bible if we can do it and still do what we want to do. That's not how it works. Wasn't how it worked when you and I were raising kids in our home? Well, we're still raising a grandson. It's not that way with, with little dude. He doesn't get to do what dude wants to do. If, if my mom and pop up or daddy, or I'm sorry, mommy has said don't do it, he's not allowed to do it. Well, what happens if he does it? Anybody want to take a guess? He gets corrected. He's getting so, he's got my stern look and harsh voice understanding. A lot of times when I say, Willie, don't do it. That's it. But it got to that point because when I said that enough, I had to get up and swat his little butt a couple times. Did I hurt him? No. But did he learn to listen? Yes. My point is, we have to purpose, purpose, on purpose, 
make a commitment to ourselves and God that what we see in this book we're going to believe and we're going to practice. Not going to argue, not going to get it logically, not going to come and ask everybody else what they think. You know, God speaks to you through this book. He doesn't tell Johnny what Louise needs out of this book. He tells Louise what Louise needs out of this book. And when God's told you, you don't have to go to 10 people and say, this is what I think God wants me to do. What do you think? The truth is they don't know. God tells you through this book. And when he showed you the truth, if we're people of determination, we'll obey the book. If we're not, we're still sucking our thumbs and sucking a bottle. Just like a rebellious child. A determination to follow the scriptures. Let me give you another one. Number four. Philippians 2 verse 5. Butch, since you're here tonight, let's pick on you. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. I can hear the pages rustling back there on his iPhone. Now, isn't that a hard verse? We could all memorize that before we leave tonight. Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. If you're going to start being mature-er and stop being more baby-like, we're going to have to have a mind that's directed by the Holy Spirit. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. How do we get that mind? We get that mind by having faith enough to, fo to follow and to listen when the Holy Spirit prompts us or teaches us from the Word of God. We get that mind when we're submitting ourselves to become and be exactly what God wants us to be. We get that mind when we're saturated with the things of God. There's this, this concept. I hear people talking about their kids giving up this or that. Well, there's this problem. If you make a child just stop doing some things, they're just going to fill that slack space with something else. What you need to do is when they take something out, we replace it with something that God wants in there. You can't just tell a kid, stop doing that. Replace it. Well, stop telling lies. We'll replace it with truth. Maybe come up with a game and say, well, let's see how many true things we can say. The sky is blue. Apples are good. Bananas are green or yellow, depending on if they're ripe or not ripe. Uh, grapes are purple or green. And just start telling stuff that's true. Replace the lies with the concept that it's just as easy to tell the truth. How about in our lives as adults? Satan says to you, you're too old, you can't serve God. What do we tell Satan? What do we always tell Satan? He's a liar. That's the first words out of our mouth when Satan tries to influence us. Our heart should immediately say to ourselves, you are a liar, Satan. Well, you can't serve God, you're too old. No, God says I'm supposed to serve him until the day I die. Well, you've just done too many bad, wicked things in your life. You can't serve God. No, Satan, you're a liar. God says I am clean and righteous in the righteousness of Christ, I can serve God because he's told me to. Satan, you're a liar. Replace those things. Get your mind saturated with the truth of the word of God. Uh, they, they, let, me, let me throw this in too. I, I do not believe Jesus walked around with a pooch mouth all the time. I don't think his tongue had rug burn on it from his lips being so low and pouting. Do you? Well, look at your neighbor and show your neighbor the face that you think Jesus had on most of the time. How many of you saw a smiley face except for Mariah? She saw the ugliest thing since <laughs> Jason's mask. But I don't believe Jesus walked around that way. Uh, you know, you are not what you think, but what you think you are. Did you get it? You're not what you think, but what you think you are. If you're constantly negative, you're a negative person. If you're constant thinking, gloomy, depressive, down thoughts, that's the person you've become. How do you want people to remember you? 
Gary Fairman dies. Everybody comes to the casket. But what you want them to remember you as, that's what you need to become. I pray at the college, and Peter and Mariah can vouch for this often, in the classes that I teach, I pray that what we learn in college will make us more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. Some of you have heard me pray that way. I don't want to be one who's constantly pushing people away from me because of my countenance. Does that mean I never get angry? Oh yeah, I get angry. It's okay to get angry. The Bible says be angry and sin not. It's when I get angry and slap Phyllis and I'm sinning. <laughs> but I can get angry and not sin. There's some things worth getting angry about. I got angry over this deal with the NFL. And shame on you if you're watching football. And that's my personal opinion. You can do with it whatever you want to. But that flag means something to me because I was one of the 1% of the servicemen like Johnny that spent time in the military and had our brothers in arms die and bleed that we might have the nation we have. I got angry about that. I'm still angry about it. I don't know if I'll ever be able to watch football again. But the point is, I don't want people to think that's the way I am about everything. You know, when these kids come in and off the bus, you know what they're starting to do to me now? I was over there this morning. You know how many of them were up and wanted a hug? That's what I want folks to remember me by. I love people. I love the stinky people. I love the mean people. I love the tall people, the short people, the fat people, the good-looking people, the ugly people, the rich people, the young people, the old people, the not-so-rich people. Anybody I left out here? I even love Butch. By the grace of God, we're going to come to that one. So the thought here is let us have a mind that's directed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus thought, and he was what he thought. What we think, that's what we become. Number five, quickly. If we want to not be babies... We need to be dominated by love for other people instead of loving ourselves. And here's, in my opinion, what hinders churches the most. People are so in love with themselves, they only want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. Um, I, I don't know how that works. I wasn't raised that way. I wasn't mentored by pastors in my past. I wasn't taught that in college. I was taught that you love people enough that you put yourself last. My earliest recollections of Sunday school was this little acrostic for joy. Jesus, others, and you. When you put you at the beginning, you're not going to have any joy. If you put others before you, if you love Jesus the utmost, and then you love other people enough to want to uh, uh, help them any way you can, and then you put yourself last. You've heard me say it. We're too narcissistic, even as Christians. It's rubbed off. It's seeped in. And somehow we need a cleansing of that. We need to get that out. I don't stand by the word of God because it's the easiest thing to do. It'd be a whole lot easier to put the bright lights up and to get a rock band on this side and uh, start wearing. I, I, I dreamed this last night. It drove me crazy. I woke up halfway in the middle of the night. I was wearing a, a, just a sports shirt, no tie, and blue jeans and tennis shoes. Now wait. I wear that all the time. But I wore it preaching. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what's going on here? I didn't have pizza for supper, so there must be something going on here. It really bothered me. Woke up in a clammy sweat. Let me just throw this in. Why do you think I wear a suit and tie when I preach? I am an ambassador to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have $800 suits. Mine usually cost 65 or 70 or 80 I did have a lady in church one time give enough money. I think I paid 130 for one. And it's, it's almost like this one, and I still wear it. But I'm an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to dress like I dress when I'm out mowing grass. Matter of fact, when 
Nellie gets sick and goes to the hospital. She says, don't you ever come in here and visit me if you don't have a suit and tie on. I don't hardly get around Nellie without a suit and tie. She scares me to death. But anyway, we're supposed to have that love for other people. It's a love that's dominated by God's love for us, how he loves us. And, and can I say this? Love's a powerful thing. You just heard Barb's testimony. You know what that is? That's a testimony of the love that this church has for one another and for other people. That's because we've tried to practice from day one a love like Jesus would practice where he's accepting people, not trying to get rid of them. I only remember one guy I told not to come back to this church. And he was a young man that came, and he was a nice young man. You all would know him if I called his name, if I could remember it, but he was spreading false doctrine. And I said, you've got two choices. You stop or you stay away from this church. Brother Gary, you told somebody not to come to church. You bet I did. When it's over doctrine, we're going to have a squabble. We're going to have a squabble. So we love people like God loved people. There's a purpose in, that God, in God's love. There's a benefit in God's love. We love them. Here's the next one. i got to hurry. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, and 18. Who wants to read? Louise, glad you got that. Phyllis, I'm going to give you the last one. Philippians 4, 13. Hold that till I get there. That will be in just a couple minutes. The, the, the next one is a denial of the world. The denial of the world. If you want to be a mature Christian, you've got to get off of the world junk food. And that's what it is. The world junk food. Uh, we, we have a little boy at our house. Have I mentioned that lately? We have a little grandson. His name's Willie. And he's getting so he's very particular about what he eats. Well, see, his mother and grandmother and I have a little difference of opinion. If he doesn't want his supper, if I wait long enough, he's going to get hungry enough, he'll eat his supper. But if he don't want his supper, well, he'll eat what he likes. How about a cookie? No. How about something sweet? No. There for a while, he wouldn't eat anything but macaroni and cheese. Now he's gotten so he's getting away from that. But he has to have what he likes. This morning we got up, we're getting ready to come to church, and, and Willie was up, so I was trying to get him some breakfast. I went to the, the place where we have a cereal. We left the bedroom. I said, Willie, you want cereal for breakfast? He says, cereal. Cereal. And that's cereal. Cereal. So I get in there. I take the one box of kid cereal out. I say, you want this? No. I take another bag of kid cereal out. I said, you want this? No. I take my shredded, uh, frosted shredded wheat, mini shredded wheats out. I say, you want this? No. I went back to him and I said, All right, I'm standing across the table. I said, Willie, you only have those three choices. Now, do you want, and I picked up the kid's cereal again. Do you want this? Cereal. That meant yes. He ate the whole bowl. Ate the whole bowl. Who has uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, 18? Okay, Louise. So we're supposed to come out from among them. We stopped at Walmart, dropped Michael off this evening to go to work. We had a couple of things we needed to pick up, so we go in. Coming out, there was these two workers, young girl workers standing there, and they were talking and jabbering and just having a good time. And I played my, one of my gruff games. I said, you guys stop having so much fun. You're supposed to be working. And the one girl falls right in step beside me. Carolyn was about a half step in front of me. She falls right in step beside me and she says, well, I'm just, how'd she say it? I'm just jovial and happy all the time. It's just my nature. Don't you want to just hang out here with me? Oh, I mean, both of you. She saw Carolyn about that time. Now, let me tell you a secret. That's what the world does. They come up to you, they side up to you, and they say, wouldn't you like to just hang out with me? I'm having so much fun. No one want to hang out with her. She's working. Part of that working is not going to be as much fun as she's making it be, right? As she's acting like it is. I don't want to hang out with her. I have a wife. But the world says, don't you want to hang out with me? No. That's called separation. Don't you want to go to the bar and kick back a few? No. Don't you want to go bet on a few horses? No. Don't you want to play some poker? No. I don't want to do those things. Here's the truth. I drank as much last week as I wanted to. I just didn't want to. I belong to the Savior. 
That's called separation. I told as many lies last week as I wanted to, but I didn't want to. That's called separation. I don't drink, I don't smoke. As a matter of fact, it's funny to me, I go to the doctor sometimes and they'll start asking you all these questions. The VA does it twice a year. Do you drink? No. Do you smoke? No. And about that time I say, I live a very boring life according to most people's standards. And I tell them, I'm a Christian, I pastor a church, I don't do any of those things. And then they laugh and giggle. But you know, we're weird because we don't do those things. And that's a, a little funny saying, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't run with a crowd to do, but that's a biblical saying, folks. We're supposed to come out from among that crowd. They don't have anything I need. Their money is counterfeit. Their gold is fool's gold. All of their fun and pleasure is but for a season, and then there's a piper to pay because the dance is not as long as you think it's going to be. We have a problem. Let me go on to the last one. This is number seven, quickly. Philippians 4.13, who had that? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You're telling me now, well, Brother Gary, I'd like to be a grown-up baby, or a grown-up Christian. I'd like to be a mature Christian, but I just don't have the strength. You know that banner? I can do all things through Christ. Paul said, when he's weak, he's strong. He had that thorn in the flesh. God said, I'm not taking it away. As long as you've got that weakness in the flesh, you can understand the strength that I have for you, my strength. And then Paul said, well, I'll glory in my weakness because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When we recognize we can't do it, Peter, you will never in the, in the flesh be able to keep Mariah happy as a husband. Any husbands in here that will vouch for that? bunch of cowards but with God's help if you do what the Bible says you can make Mariah happy Mariah you can't keep him happy in the flesh but with God's help you can have a happy marriage you can't do the job at work you're supposed to do without God's help because you're a Christian now you can't do what you're supposed to do in your own strength but Philippians 4.13 says I can do some things through Christ What's it say, Phyllis? Big girl voice. I didn't hear you. I still didn't hear you. Big girl voice. All things through Christ. He never asks us to do anything he won't help us to do. So we need to give him that life. We need to stay close to him, and we need to lean on him and draw strength from him so that we can be a mature Christian. Now, we're going to end the same way we started. How mature are you? If you're honest, you probably have a little less concept of yourself now than you did when we started. All of us should have, because all of us have room to grow. When you think you've reached it, you've gone beyond the Apostle Paul. He said he had not attained. He had not grown to the point that he was perfect, and neither have we. But we should want to. We should want to kick the bottle, get off the bottle, get off the baby food, and start doing what God wants us to do. Now, what did we talk about? Did I preach to you the word of God tonight, gave you scripture to back up what we said? Then why don't we obey it? Why don't we obey it? Heavenly Father, tonight as we close, I pray that this would become a burn